Hello friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, we always make efforts so that you are acquainted with different topics under different subjects. Friends, today in the area of English, we are going to talk on Franz Kafka. Our topic of discussion is an introduction to literary genius Franz Kafka. And for the discussion on the topic, we have with us in our studios Dr. Naya Chaudhary. Dr. Naya Chaudhary is a subject expert of English and through the live platform of CC, she makes her contribution so that it becomes easier for the students to understand various topics in detail. Now let's welcome our guest Dr. Inai Chaudhary and let's try to understand more and more about Franz Kafka. Hello Dr. Inai Chaudhary. Thank you Geetika. Hello students. In today's session I will be particularly speaking about the literary figure of Franz Kafka. Before we begin the lecture I would want you to look at certain aspects particularly the moment in which Franz Kafka was believed to have contributed, the moment which played a significant role in making Franz Kafka today a literary genius. So students, let us begin. So firstly, let us look at the moment, which is the modernist moment. So what was the modernist moment? The modernist moment was a moment which began during the period of early 20th century. Why I am using the word 20th century is because it would not be fair to categorize and give it a specific year as its beginning. So that is why I am using the term 20th century. The early 20th century was marked by the end of the Victorian rule. Several changes also took place. For instance, Einstein came up with the theory of specific uh, relativity. Similarly, lot of other contributions were made. And gradually the modernist movement came into being. Now let us also look at the characteristics of modernist movement. After that I will be looking how Franz Kafka was impacted from these characteristics and then gradually we will shift our lecture towards introducing Franz Kafka and try to establish why in contemporary times he is considered a literary genius. So let us begin with the characteristics of the modernist movement. So the first characteristic that I would like to emphasize upon in the modernist movement is that modernist movement is marked by the break away from the tradition. What I am trying to state here by this statement is that this was a movement which saw a strong reaction against the very established norms which one gets to see during the previous uh, movement that preceded it. For instance, the Victorian movement. So the modernist movement, you know, before the Victorian period was romantic movement, then came the Victorian uh, period and Victorian period was marked by the beginning of the modernist movement which in fact uh, was a lot of uh, critics also consider it towards the 19th century that the modernist movement came into being. Some consider it that it came into being in the early 20th century. But uh, more or less, let us consider it uh, you know, somewhere around the early 20th century, the beginning of modernist movement to come somewhere around 20th century. So the break away of tradition, from tradition was from the very established norms, be it the religious norms, be it the cultural norms, be it the societal norms, it broke away from this tradition. So, you know, one is immediately reminded of Ezra Pound's statement to make it new. What was being made new? The very foundations that were established in the Victorian period now were under transgression and the attempt was to make it new, to re-establish, to create an unsettling uh, uh, lineage of of characteristics and this is where and how modernist movement came to be defined. Now the second characteristic that I would like to speak about is that in the modernist period or in the literature of uh, which was being written during the modernist period, one notices that all things are relative. There is no such thing as an established truth. This is very significant and this is something which one gets to see not only in the works of Franz Kafka but also in the works of various other literary figures, be it James Joyce, be it Virginia Woolf, be it E.M. Foster and so on. 
So it is for this that you know one notices that the, from the uh, there is the narration that uh, uh, revolves around various texts has multiple perspectives. There is no single narrative that one uh, you know can see. One notices multiple perspectives that are being developed when one notices the uh, in the reading of the text. There is no single point around which the theme revolves. Every theme can be explored through various arenas. And this is what modernist period is about. In fact, various techniques and characteristics are also used to demonstrate this very aspect. Now, let us move forward. Individualism occupies a crucial role in the modernist period. The very found, the, you know, the very fact that an individual plays a significant role, and you know, that is where the idea of existentialism comes into being, becomes very significant. Similarly, when I am talking about individualism, it is more about the subjective aspect. Therefore, I am particularly talking about the inner psychological aspect of a human. And the modernist period, in fact, this is the best period where one gets to see the inner workings of the human mind. And that is where the technique and the uh, you know, idea of stream of consciousness comes into being. So be it uh, Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway or be it James Joyce's Ulysses, all of these texts explore the inner psychology of human uh, mind. Let us move ahead. The next uh, aspect that I would like to talk about in the modernist uh, period is that there is a destabilization and fragmentation of reality that one gets to witness. Why? Uh, are we moving towards this unsettling uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, characteristics? Why is that so? Because the very setting of modernist period was marked by two world wars. There was chaos. Humans uh, did not know what the future uh, would hold for them. Pessimism was there in the atmosphere. And that is why the writings also reflected the same the inner psychologies, the turmoil that one uh, the, went through in the inner psychologies were well reflected in these works. The next aspect that I would like to talk about is the alienation of the artist and the individual. Now, what do I mean by the term alienation? Alienation uh, has several meanings. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, distant, some, an individual who uh, stands distanced from another entity. Uh, there is a sense of separation. Uh, one is also reminded of a you know, negative connotation. Uh, you don't want to be involved. You become a bit uh, introvert. So there is a sense of alienation of not only the individual, but also the artist. And that is perhaps where one notices the very features that the artist uh, feels or goes through are well exemplified in his works. In fact, he, rep he, becomes a, he or she becomes the true representative of uh, his or times during which uh, the writings are being written. And this is what modernist period is about. You know, so several, uh, I would also like to speak about several techniques which are significant during this period. Firstly, is like the stream of consciousness which I spoke about. Following it can be the multiple narrator perspective which one gets to witness. There is also usage of various symbols and allusions which one traces throughout these, the works of the modernist writers. Similarly, use of metaphors and substitutions is an, another important literary technique and device which is used to portray the literary work of the modernist period. Similarly, there is no proper uh, chronology in, you know, in certain works. One notice that there is a non-sequential narration. And why is there a non-sequential narration? I'm just, uh, you know, uh, differing, diff um, shifting a bit from the top. Now, that's because, you know, that is how the inner mind works, inner psychology works. And, you know, to bring the audience uh, very closer to this very aspect, there is a non-sequential. Does a mind work in sequence? No, it is completely non-sequential. And that is why the narration itself becomes non-sequential. And so, the period of modernism is well highlighted through its characteristics. If we move forward, one also notices other themes which echo throughout the works. The theme of decay is very important. The theme of destruction, death, loss, futility. Now, like I said, the works of modernists challenged and unsettled the audience and readers. 
and this is well evidenced through the various works, through the various techniques which is employed uh, not only by the writers but also in other fields. Now I would like to uh, here come back to uh, an important point. I am reminded of uh, Bertolt Brecht's theatre which was again uh, being uh, produced during this time. So he came up with the idea of uh, alienation effect. Similarly, a Russian uh, uh, you know, art, uh, artist came up with the idea of defamiliarization. And then Franz Kafka came up uh, with the very idea of uh, the uh, absurdity, the idea of absurdity. So all of this, what, what is it trying to show? What are these ideas trying to show? They are trying to introduce and challenge the very audience and the readers by including an element of surprise by distancing the reader, by distancing the audience, uh, by a sense of introducing a sense of shock, by introducing a sense of anything which is or which makes the audience or the reader uh, feel uh, discomfort. There is a sense of discomfort, unsettlement that one is introduced to. And by these techniques, you know, when you feel a certain kind of uneasiness, you perhaps then best are able to reflect upon the surroundings and this is what all of them have tried to do. Now let us move ahead. What is the relationship between Kafka and modernism? I spoke about few uh, chief characteristics of um, modernist period. Now let us talk about Kafka and modernism. Let us look at the slide. Now, the very aspect of modernism, as I said, was marked by something which had a certain pessimistic tone about it. Individualistic uh, uh, attitude became important. Now, idea of dehumanization, which is again a sub-theme in the works of uh, Kafka and as well as modernist literature, becomes extremely significant. Now, when I am using the term, Dehumanization. What do I mean? Of course, in a literary sense, it means making anybody seem less human. This is what dehumanization means. But it was a very critical term which was being applied during that period because of the way it uh, you know, shook the very boundaries and uh, foundations of the way power structures were maintained and they functioned. And the very idea of dehumanization was witnessed not only by the artist which, who is uh, Franz Kafka himself, but you know, it is well re uh, visible in the works of Kafka. Let me try to explain. Ahead, I will be talking about Kafka's uh, uh, lifetime, but here let me just try to explain. Uh, he did not have a very good relationship with his father. This is well evidenced in his uh, works when we analyze upon them in the upcoming slides. So the whole idea of dehumanization where uh, the very power structures are, uh, you know, uh, gets uh, uh, removed, the very power structures are questioned, the very power structures are uh, questioned because of the very existence. And this is what dehumanization is about. It's not just in the literary sense that we are talking about. It's about how the society questions the very norms and reduces an individual in all the realms to something way below, something that is uh, disturbing, something that is unsettling, something that is, makes one uh, feel a uh, lot of uh, at uneasiness. This is what dehumanization is about. So Kafka did not have a very good relationship with his father. There was a sense of dehumanization which was being developed in his mind. And this is well evidenced even in his work. For instance, the work, the famous work in fact, the novella Metamorphosis, which was written in the period of 1915, plays a very significant role here. What one witnesses there that the pr protagonist, Grigor Samsa, is reduced to the role or is transformed. Physically, he is transformed into a pest. In fact, the German term that is used actually gets converted into a pest. Lot of texts uh, or lot of critics call, um, refer to it as an insect and lot of other uh, synonyms are used for it. But you know, when you convert it, it uh, actually means pest. So he's reduced to something way below the level of, uh, you know, humans that is a pest. And this is how the idea of dehumanization, which the artist felt 
in his own uh, you know lifetime he felt it at several levels be it at the uh, working at the you know at his in his professional life be it in his types about his uh, types with his family his relationship with his father uh, his love affairs at several levels he felt a sense of dehumanization which again gets reflected in his characters and particularly the protagonist for instance in metamorphosis the character of uh, grigor uh, depicts it similarly when we you know look at the work of uh, the trial which was written in the period of uh, 1925 one notices that the chief characteristic uh, character the protagonist joseph k doesn't even get the dignity of a full name he's you know reduced to being called joseph k you know the beauty of franz kafka is that the work itself makes you have multiple interpretations when it is being written and that's the beauty of franz kafka you perhaps students would not uh, you will think differently when you ha go have a first reading in the second reading you will have a very different approach to it and that's the beauty of franz kafka even the literature but franz kafka makes use of several uh, connotations and denotations which make you wonder which instigates a sense of uh, you know you are made to question a lot of things around you a lot of themes are like, lay expose the very idea that franz kafka is trying to portray and therefore uh, franz kafka becomes a crucial figure during not only the modernist literature even till in the contemporary times he continues to occupy a significant position let's go to the next uh, point alienation isolation and injustice this is again very significant these are the aspect which one gets to see in the writings of kafka himself the very idea of alienation the very idea of isolation and injustice was something which he felt in his own lifetime during his own relationship with the father he uh, even happens to say at uh, several places that uh, he questioned the very idea of uh, parenting he questioned it not in a very negative sense but in a critical sense that you know that bond the parenting bond compels one uh, uh, to you know keeps one uh, binded to the uh, parents and that is what kafka tries to question and uh, i will discuss about it later but all these themes are well reflected in uh, the very artist and then uh, again you get to see it in the works be it the metamorphosis be it the trial be it the his work castle anything any work that he writes one gets to see these themes and these are crucial themes in the period of modernism so you know it's very important to understand that when literature is being written it gets deeply impacted as well as impacts the very period in which it is being written so modernism and its characteristics are well evidenced in the works of franz kafka let us move ahead now the i uh, you know the idea of uh, kafkaesk is very important which i'll be discussing separately in separate slides so let me skip this for a moment let me come to another point the idea of surrealism the idea of absurdity the idea of bewilderment and the idea of existentialism all of these themes are very significant why because th these themes are representative of the age to which they belonged when i'm using the word surrealism what do i mean surrealism is nothing in fact it was uh, put forward the chief proponent of surrealism was andre breton and uh, i think he introduced it somewhere in 1920s and uh, that is where uh, surrealism came into being as a terminology and uh, it was during the modernist period that it was being extensively used and surrealism is nothing but the juxtaposition of the unreal with the real world so the idea of surprise the idea of uh, strange things is introduced uh, with the very aspect of surrealism to uh, pull the reader to pull the audience towards the work towards the production and that is why the idea of surrealism was used even in paintings you get to see this aspect so surrealism has a very significant role to play and uh, even in the works of kafka like i said you get to see it i mean do you see in daily life uh, a human turning into a pest of course not but what is he trying to uh, speak through it he's trying to exemplify 
through the protagonist Grigor several messages and he succeeds in doing that. Perhaps that is why today the work, the Metamorphosis is a significant work. It has been widely read. It has been prescribed by several institutions and universities all over the world. So Franz Kafka succeeded in sending a message to the audience and sending a message to the world. What was the message? The message was about the whole idea about the individuality, about the individualism which uh, lay disturbed in the very essence of life. And that is where I would like to bring the next uh, theme, the next crucial term, existentialism. What is existentialism? Existentialism is about the human existence and the situations in which human comes to deal with the idea of existence. It was put forward by Soren Kierkegaard and this is a very crucial term. I would request you to look at this term separately and its characteristics in further detail separately. But for now, if I have to speak as a layman, existentialism is nothing but how a human in daily life tries to exist despite of the way the universe works against it or with it. This is what existentialism is. And this is where the famous uh, phrase comes, in, comes into being that existence precedes a sense. It's the very existence of human that plays a significant role rather than the a sense. A sense comes later on. And the very idea of existence is reflected in the works of Franz Kafka. The character of metamorphosis, the character uh, in the trial, Joseph K, all of them have to work against the societal pressures have to work against uh, the illogical uh, workings of the universe just to exist. And this is what existentialism is about. Now, suppose I have to talk about the next term, bewilderment. What, what is bewilderment? Bewilderment, as you know, uh, students, is an important term again in the modernist period. Here one gets to see not only the characters are bewildered in the works of Franz Kafka, but it makes the readers also go through a sense of bewilderment. And how does Franz Kafka achieve it? By introducing these very aspects of absurdity, surrealism. He is able to uh, you know, introduce the element of bewilderment, not only in the characters, but also in the reader. In fact, another uh, significant aspect to be noted here is he also succeeds by introducing bewilderment in the readers is by, uh, you know, he reveals about the characters in a very limited sense. So as much as the characters know, it is the same amount that the readers know. There are no extra references made to reveal more about the plot, more about the storyline. The way the character works through the uh, writings is the same way that the reader also is made to uh, go through the text. The, and the plot that is being uh, that is being written there is no new information by narrator and so there is limited knowledge of the character and same knowledge that the character has the same knowledge the reader has and that is why the sense of bewilderment exists even in the readers so students i am reminded here of uh, an important uh, critical input that i would uh, like to put here is the idea of readerly text and writerly text which was put forward by Roland Barth. When he was talking about writerly text, writerly text as per Roland Barth was being written during the chiefly during the modernist period and readerly text was being written in the periods before it. What do I mean by the two terms writerly text and readerly text? When I am talking about the term writerly text it means that you know you can't assign definite interpretation and in fact, it invites the readers to make sense of the text. And this is what is crucial and this is what Kafka beautifully exceeds, you know, succeeds in doing. He invites the reader to interpret the text by themselves, by providing, uh, by, you know, putting them in a cocoon of limited knowledge. So this is why the modernist period, as per Roland Barth, deals with texts which are writerly text. Similarly, as per him, readerly text is something that in which the information already exists and it is just to be accepted by the writer. 
or I mean the reader, it is it just simply has to be accepted by the reader. And that is where writerly text as per me becomes very significant and also because of the way it helps to create a sense of or produce a sense of uh, initiate a sense of thinking stimulus in the reader. The very aspect what uh, you know needs to be done is being introduced through the retail, uh, uh, through the writerly text and that is a beautiful statement that is a beautiful uh, aspect that uh, Roland Barth introduced in his works. Let us come to the next point. The reality is being characterized by uncertainty, ambiguity and perplexity. What I am trying to state here is that the aspect of realism exists, but how does it become all the more real? By introducing the very characteristics that existed during that time. There was uncertainty because this was a period which was marked by world war. People did not know where uh, their country was heading towards, what future held for them and therefore there was a sense of uncertainty, there was a sense of ambiguity, by ambiguity of course I mean you know there was uh, there were certain doubts, there were also certain perplex, uh, perplexity, there is a sense of confusion also existed, you did not know what steps to take, you did not knew, uh, you did not know how to move about in the future and these were the aspects that Kafka also demonstrates powerfully in his works. Now, uh, before I move ahead, I would like to state that uh, I would want students for you to ponder over what I what all I said. In my next session, I will take it forward from here and then we will further try to understand not only about Kafka but also about his works and why he in contemporary time is considered to be a literary genius despite of writing a very short amount of literary works. Thank you students. With this note we would like to thank Dr. Nair Chaudhary for giving us this precious session on uh, Kafka. Dear friends there is lot more for you so you are requested to be with us as we are back after a short break. Thank you. Hello friends, welcome back to this session. Friends, as you know that today we are talking, talking on Friends Kafka and uh, for the discussion on the topic we have with us in our studios Dr. Naya Chaudhary. Dr. Naya Chaudhary is a subject expert of uh, English and through her we are learning more and more about Franz Kafka. So let's welcome our guest Dr. Naya Chaudhary and let's try to learn more and uh, gather maximum knowledge through her. Hello Dr. Naya Chaudhary. Thank you Geetika. Hello students. Let us continue to where we left. I was speaking about Franz Kafka where I spoke about introduced his certain works but chiefly I spoke about the period of modernist literature and the period of uh, modernism as well as the literature in which the books or the writings were being written and how it impacted 
and was impacted by the writings that were being written during this period. I spoke about the characteristics of the modernist period. I spoke about how Franz Kafka uses those very characteristics in his works. And I try to establish how Franz Kafka was and is and continues to be a literary genius in the contemporary times. So the last uh, what I spoke about was the, how Kafka was impacted and took forward the idea of modernism in his works. We spoke about several uh, characteristics, uh, idea of uh, dehumanization, alienation, isolation and injustice, the idea of Kafkaesque, the idea of uh, inescapability, idea of surrealism, absurdity, bewilderment and existentialism and lastly reality which is marked by a sense of uncertainty, perplexity and ambiguity. Now let me just uh, take it forward for the you know a sense of continuation I am taking it forward from the last point. Now the reality in the modernist period was being marked by uncertainty ambiguity and perplexity and for this I am using a paragraph from Kafka's short prose The Passenger so that it will help you to understand. Let us uh, move forward. Let me first read you this paragraph and try to establish what I am trying to state here. Now when I read the paragraph students I would want you to understand that literature is not just about reading it is also about analyzing. So when I am reading the paragraph, try to understand and try to trace how you can see the very elements of confusion, doubtfulness, you know, let us see in the daily lives. So let me begin. I am standing on the platform of the tram and I am entirely uncertain with regard to my place in this world, in this town, in my family. Not even approximately could I state what claims I might justifiably advance in any direction. I am quite unable to defend the fact that I am standing on this platform, holding on to this trap, letting myself be carried along by this tram and that people are getting out of the tram's way or walking along quietly or pausing in front of the shop windows. Not that anyone asked me to, but that is immaterial. So students, what, 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 what can you see here? Immediately, you are able to see a sense of uneasiness in the writer's mind, a sense of uneasiness in the character's mind. The human psychology is moving forward with so many emotions. There is a sense of uh, motions in which, you know, uh, there is juxtaposition of uh, various thought processes. The life that is going on in ahead, uh, you know, ahead of the character, he is thinking about his family at the uh, same time he is having philosophical uh, uh, thoughts that what life is about, what is it about and this is what existentialism is about. This is what when human questions the very idea of the kind of choices that he is able to make. The very idea of exploring the human psychology is a chief characteristic of the modernist literature and the period in, it was, in which it was being written. And this is what Kafka succeeds in showing us beautifully. These very characteristics are very visible here. So in reality, when you, you know, when an individual is placed in a real life situation, this is what, you know, one notices that the character goes through. The very idea of how he questions everything, the very idea of how he puts an exclamation mark on everything. He's unable to decide on a lot of things. He's unable to uh, conclude on a lot of things. So this is what absurdity, this is what uh, bewilderment, confusion, chaos, is about which could be seen in the period of the mod, uh, modernism. Now let us move ahead. Now here uh, you know I had spoken about the characteristics of modernism and how Franz Kafka incorporates those very characteristics not because he was compelled or anything of that sort but because he was writing during that period which was marred by disillusionment, there was war, uh, there was uncertainty, uh, a lot of other characteristics like uh, confusion, chaos, etc. Let us move forward and try to understand how and what Franz Kafka's life was like. You know, this will help you to understand how he started writing his works. So, you, I try to incorporate the modernist characteristics, the period in which he was born. 
I try to uh, revolve around that very idea. And now I'm trying to understand his very lifetime, how he lived, you know, how, the kind of relationship he had, the, what friends did he have, what kind of, uh, uh, you know, romantic engagements he had with uh, people. Let us try to understand that because that is a crucial aspect. You know, when you're reading literature, you not only have to look at uh, the period in which it is being written because that deeply impacts the, you know, uh, critical author, but also his own life. You know, the, his own life uh, plays a significant role in making him do what he is, in establishing him uh, or, you know, uh, take forward a profession that, uh, why has he taken forward to that profession? Why did he uh, decide to write? Why, why are his characters marked by a sense of uh, chaos? Why is there so much chaos in his works? Why are there elements of uh, surrealism in his works? This you will understand when we uh, try to know about his life. So let us look at it. Franz Kafka was born into a Jewish middle class German speaking family in uh, Czech Republic and was the first child. Immediately, students, uh, you notice something very different. What is it? He was a Jew living in Czech Republic, which of course, and uh, German speaking. Of course, uh, I'm sure the, uh, you know, ling linguistic tongue there was uh, not German. It was, I think, uh, they were Czech speaking people. So, immediately there, he must have felt somewhere a sense of uh, alienation, not only because of his religion, but also because of the kind of language that he spoke. He immediately, you know, you place him as somebody who perhaps belonged to a set of um, mi minorities. Next, come, let's come to the next point. He had three younger sisters, all of whom suffered as they died in concentration camps during the World War II. Tragedy, of course. His father ran a fancy goods shop in Prague, whose income provided a comfortable living to the family. So unlike a lot of critics who consider him to belong to a poor family, he was, uh, he uh, had a decent living. It was, I think, in, uh, in terms of uh, monetary aspect, it was not that he suffered a lot because his father had a decent fancy goods shop. During his growing up days, he extensively read Nietzsche, Darwin and Spinoza. His fiction was written in German and he learned Czech only later in his life. Look at this important statement. He wrote chiefly in German. He adopted that very language which belonged to him. And it was only during his later life that he felt it uh, to be a necessity, necessity to learn the language of Czech. He studied law and finish, finished his doctorate in law in 1906. Now, the very aspect that he studied law is very crucial because of the social bureaucratic uh, powers uh, and the themes that revolves around it that he questions. And perhaps this knowledge this knowledge of uh, the way uh, the, uh, you know, these aspects work the, perhaps came to him from the very uh, fact that he studied law. The critical aspect was enhanced in him through the very fact that he studied law. He is able to question the very uh, aspects that exist, the power, uh, the way the working of the power exists in the public arena. So this perhaps came to him from his studying of the subject of law. And in fact, uh, uh, the trial is a significant, uh, you know, a work where I immediately can think of uh, when I'm, you know, made to remember his, uh, about his own bio, uh, you know, biographical details that he had studied law. Anyways, let us move ahead. He thought little of relationships, but had several romantic associations. Now, this aspect is something I will be talking about in the upcoming slides between 1909 and 1910. He went on to write several pieces of fiction as well as short stories. This is also a significant period as it was during this time that he met his most long-lasting friend, Marx uh, Broad. He was the same man who refused to burn his writings as suggested by Kafka after his death. So this was what and is Franz Kafka is about. In fact, this is a very uh, interesting point here that he had asked his friend perhaps in his will or through a verbal communication for him to burn his works. But Broad felt it better and in fact today we are fortunate enough thanks to his friend Broad that we were introduced to the literary genius of Franz Kafka because he perhaps gained even more fame 
posthumously after his death when his work began to be published through the help of his friend Broad. The year 1911 saw him writing the America which would be published only posthumously and in 1912 he went on to write the most famous works The Metamorphosis and The Judgment. I think the, and the year 1913 saw Kafka publish his first collection of short fiction Meditation. In fact 1914 saw him begin his work on the most famous work The Trial. Let's move ahead. In 1917, he was detected with a hemorrhage which proved tubercular. It was only towards the end of his life that he began taking interest in learning the language of Hebrew. He died in Kirling on June 3rd and was buried in the Jewish cemetery. He left three unfinished novels and large amount of diaries and notebooks. So if, you, if we want to understand more about it, perhaps we can look at his diaries, we can uh, go through his various uh, literary works and writings to have a deeper understanding of what the character of or a person was in the, uh, you know, human that he was in uh, Franz Kafka, how he existed during his lifetime and how he played a crucial uh, role and the kind of role that he played and how he was impacted by, by the way he came into being. Now here I want to explore another important uh, theme that is the myth of Kafka. What I am trying to state here by when I am using the word myth of Kafka are, is perhaps the very fact that myth as per William Bascom's article, the forms of folklore, prose narratives are what is myth? I am trying to define it first, are basically tales believed as true, usually sacred set in the distant past or other worlds or parts of the world and with extra human, inhuman or heroic characters. So the idea of myth of Kafka. So the very idea of myth of Kafka lies in the author himself. This origin of the myth of Kafka lies in the author himself. What, why am I saying that? Because of how the works that he wrote had a crucial reason to be written because of what he himself was. The work had a crucial, had a significant characteristics that the work reflected was because of the very identity of Franz Kafka. Let us try to understand that. One can trace Franz Kafka in his very literary creations, Carl Rosman in America, Joseph K in the trial and K in the castle. So you know Franz Kafka can easily be traced. The kind of person that he is in real life can be traced in his very uh, protagonist. And this is what the myth of Kafka is about. The myth, the origin of the myth of Kafka lies in the author himself. And this is what one can see. And you know, as you have understood his lifetime, you will realize a lot of themes that dominate in the very works also reflect the very real, uh, fr what Kaf Franz Kafka is. Let us move ahead. Diaries and letters reflect about Kafka and his experiences. They help one to understand how he began fictionalizing himself into writings. Like I said, in fact, his longest piece of self-analysis, the famous letter to his father, written in 1919, provide a deep understanding of his life. Let us try to understand it. So Hermann Kafka, the father was a dominating personality who criticized his children often and was sarcastic. He was physically well-built also. And, uh, you know, in his work, Letter to His Father, he, there is, um, you know, critical analysis of the very kind of relationship that he had with his father. In fact, you know, he went on to make a famous statement in it that I was oppressed by your sheer corporal reality, by the very, uh, you know, uh, uh, well-built body of the father is what made him feel uh, scared, made him feel uh, suppressed, made him feel dehumanized if, uh, if I have to use a very strong term and that very idea is well reflected in his works. In fact, at the dinner tables, he would have huge amount of food in large mouthfuls. I mean, such was the personality, you know, the uh, kind of image that one, you know, gets in one's mind is what he's talking about in his works and this critical analysis is and has a deep impact on Franz Kafka and that is why perhaps he writes it and also can be seen to be fictionalized in his very characters. Further, Franz Kafka doesn't get another picture of his parents because of the way 
uh, the kind of pressure that Franz Kafka had to go through can also be because he had three sisters. He lost his uh, two brothers at a young age. His uh, cousin Bruno Kafka uh, does well as a professor of law and later a prominent figure. And instead, you know, Franz Kafka has very unconventional interest. And you know, perhaps, you know, that is why he does not have a very amicable relationship with his parents. He also feels sometimes that you know, mother is caught between the children and the husband. And he feels sorry for the mother. And one also gets to see that mother does not have a very uh, dominant role to play in the uh, family setup. Similarly, uh, you know, th this kind of uh, family setup is what perhaps, you know, has a deep impact on Franz Kafka. And he does not, uh, has very, uh, is not very keen to get married. Because he questions the very idea of marriage, you know, because he's seeing his father, the way he lives with the mother, the way he lives with the children. And, uh, you know, that is something he questions. And th perhaps that is why he's not able to settle down in relationships. And he, even though he has a lot of uh, uh, romantic linkages, he's not able to permanently settle down in a proper kind of a relationship. Now, writings, in fact, was something that helped him to escape and provided some relief. This is what he often cites in his letter to his father. In fact, he openly says that all my writing was about you. I only lamented there the things I couldn't lament on your breast. And that is so significant. The kind of suppression he felt under his father was something. And, you know, so writing became a kind of therapy for him. It provided him a release of his emotions. It provided him um, uh, to become a better individual because he was able to release all his emotions, all his uh, uh, aspects which he did not like about uh, his relationship with his father or the kind of uh, timid role that his mother got to play in his writings. In fact, he brought them to reality by fictionalizing the very characters and play the same role as the father. So therefore, it's very important to say that though the literature provided him an escape from life, literature became his life. And this is what and why uh, Franz Kafka is considered today a literary genius because he was able to beautifully demonstrate powerfully the themes of his times, of his own life in fact. Letter depicts the damage of self-esteem due to parents' expectations and bad upbringing. This is something which gets reflected in the letter. It also, like I said, demonstrates... Uh, the reduced role of the mother, like he makes an important statement here, we hammered at her ruthlessly, you from your side, we from ours. It is such a painful statement. The mother was reduced to being nothing, mere nothing. Again, she was also dehumanized and he realizes that. And that is why he has a very close relationship uh, with the opposite sex, be it uh, the sisters, be it his uh, romantic linkages. But Again, in romantic linkages, he does not want to sell, uh, settle down in the aspect of marriage. Why? Because uh, he sees this very marital setup through, exemplified through his father, the kind of relationship he has with his mother. He does not want to get into it. He, he, he becomes uh, you know, rebellious towards that very aspect of marriage, that bond. Now, another important aspect that his work letter to his father reflects is and helps us to understand that he, he makes a famous statement here, I do not have literary interest, I consist of literature, I am nothing else and cannot be anything else. Therefore, writing becomes very important to him. It is so significant to him that he, he feels that it is a crucial aspect of uh, his life. Writing is so important to him. And that is how letter to his father reveals a lot about him and hence one gets to understand why. Franz Kafka and how the life in which Franz Kafka lived impacted not only him but also his writings. Now let us come to the another significant term, Kafkaesque. What is Kafkaesque? The term refers to German existential novelist Franz Kafka's literary writings which are revolves around the idea of alienation. If I have to cite from the dictionary of Merriam-Webster, it is defined as of relating to or suggestive of Franz Kafka of a, or his writings, especially having a nightmarishly complex, bizarre or illogical quality. So aspect of surrealism also can be seen in it. And, you know, one gets to see it in the trial also where the protagonist Joseph K is hauled into the court and asked, how do you plead? Joseph K asks, what are the chain charges? But the court is not ready to tell them what the charges are. You know, so he stands accused 
or something which he does not know what he is accused of. So this is completely Kafkaesque and this is an important element in his works. So you know before I deal in my you know le next lecture I will be talking about metamorphosis. So before I move on to that I want you to know in detail about these terminologies and how he makes use of element of modernism which again I will be able to trace in the very work of the metamorphosis. But again it is better to understand because I am here introducing you what Franz Kafka was all about and Kafka is, is an important and a crucial element in his work. Critic Harold Bloom refers to the word Kafka is as an unspecified negation. Again very significant statement. Kafka's world appears to be surrealistic world and you know as you can see in the picture you know you don't understand what this is so it is marked by you know bizarre it is complex there is um, it's all illogical you know it is surrealist there is juxtaposition you know of course you know stairs upside down you don't see it anywhere there is confusion chaos you don't see it but this is what is Kafka is, is all about and you know by using this very uh, technique of uh, Kafka is Franz Kafka is able to powerfully demonstrate his ideas to the readers or the audience who decide to read his text. And this very aspect like I said is the same as Bertolt Brecht using the idea of alienation effect or uh, the idea of um, you know uh, defamiliarization being used uh, by the uh, Russian artist. I cannot recall his name at this point of time. Please uh, do uh, search for the idea of defamiliarization which is being used by the Russian artist. All of this are used to basically attract the reader to gather their attention to the very themes that they are trying to explore and hence they succeed in doing it. Next. Now if I have to uh, you know define Kafkaist through a religious perspective. One, I would like to talk about a Jewish interpretation and second, I would like to talk about a Christian interpretation. Let us look at it. If I have to see the word Kafka is, because you know Kafka is, has multiple meanings, several layers of meanings is what Kafka is, is about. In fact, students, when you will begin reading Franz Kafka, you will have your own layers of meanings. Again, very important it is, don't um, you know, stick to the fact that it particularly has a negative connotation to it. It is much more than that, you know, it is trying to also deliver you a moral message. So yes, it is since literature is open to interpretation, you can have your own interpretation. But again, try to understand that they should be well exemplified with various literary facts. Let us look at the Jewish interpretation. If I have to have a religious understanding and I have to interpret in a Jewish manner. So the term seems to exemplify a Jewish search for a safe and secure place that they can look upon to as their homeland. In fact, uh, something that is Kafka is what Franz Kafka himself went through because um, he was uh, you know, residing in a place known as Czech Republic and again as you know he was a Jewish minority there speaking another minority language and th that itself is Kafka is if you know I have to have a Jewish interpretation. Similarly, if I have to have a Christian interpretation, perhaps it is where the Christian church is an imperfect bridge between people and God that becomes Kafka. Anything that is illogical that does not make sense to highlight a particular point is Kafka. You know. Next, Frederick R. Carr in his work Franz Kafka represented man states it to be a world which has its own guidelines, rules, behavior which is not manageable by human will. This is what Kafka is according to this critic. And like I said, it does not always have to be negative and inhuman. However, it is used primarily in a dark sense to depict the way of the world. You know, such is life, such is the way of the world. The ill, sometimes you consider, you know, situations and the events that are happening around you to be illogical, completely that they don't make sense. And this is what the idea of uh, Kafka is, is trying to explore through the very idea that it demonstrates powerfully the ideas of alienation, the nightmarish feeling, the uh, chaos, the uh, you know surrealist elements etc. Next is an, another important uh, aspect of Kafka is Kafka is that I want to talk about which Franz Kafka uses is when he is talking about the metaphor of Kafka is bureaucracy. Now when I am talking about the metaphor of Kafka is bureaucracy. Before that I would like to talk about one important statement is that Franz Kafka without a psychological approach is not Kafka. 
So students, when you are uh, beginning to read Franz Kafka, and I've introduced him here in my lecture, please try to understand that you need to have a psychological understanding of it. And I would want you to go through uh, the various works of Freud and then try to link it up with Franz Kafka also. The very idea of, uh, you know, a lot of things, Maslow's uh, hierarchy of the needs, also uh, motivation, please look at that also and try to link it up. You know, this is what literature is about. Don't reduce it to a specific discipline. Don't just reduce literature to literature. Link it with all aspects that you see uh, happening around you, be it the so societal aspects, the political aspects, the cultural aspects. Make it multidisciplinary. Now, what is metaphor of Kafka is bureaucracy. Now, Weber's form, Weber was another important uh, critic, Weber's form of bureaucracy revolves around the characteristics of rationality. So bureaucracy was marked according to Weber by rationality, something which is where there is goal orientation. But Kafka's form of bureaucracy is very different. And this is what Kafka's bureaucracy was all about. And in fact, this is well reflected in his work, The Trial, The Castle, and in The Penal Co Colony. Now, Kafka's bureaucracy refers to patrimonial abuse. There is rule breaking, there is chaos, there is corruption, there is inefficiency, there is red tapism, there is denial, cheats, uh, cheatings are there, etc. Individual is powerless here because the society or the power structures make you feel timid, make you uh, feel suppressed. And a sense of totalitarian regime is also loose into play, which one gets to see in the works of the trial. And this is what the idea of Kafka's bureaucracy is about. Finally, if I have to talk about Kafka and institutions that he deals with, primarily the first institution that he speaks about is the family. Kafka's own personal experience have not been very good about uh, when, he, when we talk about how he is engaged with his family. And this also gets reflected in his work, all of his work in fact. Whether it is the metamorphosis, where the character is or is you know, secluded, alienated and eventually dies a bitter death by the very family member with, which he, with whom he was living. Or whether it is the trial where, where again you know, he goes through a lot of turmoil. I would not go into much detail because in my next uh, lecture I will be talking about it in detail. The next is public institutions. Not only does he explore the institution of family, he is also exploring the idea of public institution. The idea of bureaucracy, the idea of how various power organizations are to be questioned, be it the court, be it man at the organization, the kind of sufferings that he has to go through because again existentialism and this is how things work. And this is how he tries to enlighten the very readers to the way the hierarchy system exists in the public institution. And the idea of freedom, which most of his protagonists are denied in a very illogical manner. So students, this, was, this is what Franz Kafka is about. And now in the next session, I will be talking about the work of metamorphosis in detail. Before you begin the metamorphosis, I would want you to understand that Franz Kafka is primarily a significant figure because of how and in the period that he was writing. However, even in today's time, he is and continues to be a literary genius, primarily because of the way he wrote, the multiple interpretations of the text that one gets introduced to in his works and so on. Before I end my lecture, I would like to end it with a quote which was put forward by W. H. Auden, which beautifully exemplifies the kind of role he continues to occupy even today in the literary circles. W. H. Auden had once famously stated, had one to name the author who comes nearest to bearing the same kind of relation to our age as Dante, Shakespeare or Goethe have to theirs, Kafka is the first one would think of. Such is uh, the beauty of Kafka. Therefore, students, I would see you in my next session where I will be talking about the work of um, the Metamorphosis, written by Franz Kafka, the literary genius. Thank you, students. With this note, we would like to thank Dr. Naya Chaudhary for giving us this um, precious session on Franz Kafka. Dear friends, we believe that you might have lots of questions. So friends, if you want to write to us at info.cc, do write to us. We'll try to give answers to your questions when next time Dr. Naya Chaudhary visits our studio. Till then, take care, goodbye, and guess keep writing and keep watching us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Naya Chaudhary. Thank you, Geetika.